Hey guys, how we doing? Cameron here again from Asus, back again with another episode of our Industry Insights podcast. I've been loving the feedback from you guys so far, it's been amazing. Uh, we really love you guys to get a little bit more involved, so please like, comment the video, share it around to all your mates, and if you've got any questions you want asked on, uh, on an upcoming episode, please comment down below and we'll do our best to try and get the, uh, get the questions around to all the people we're interviewing. Um, so my guest this week is Molly Coleman from Ridley. Molly, how are you doing? Yeah, good, Cam. Going good. <laughs> good to see you again. Um, so, Molly, you're a process engineer at Ridley. Can you tell us a little bit about Ridley? What are they all about? What do they do? Sure, sure. So, yeah, I'm a process engineer with Ridley. I started with them officially last year as an intern. Um, basically, what they do is provide high-performance animal nutrition solutions to their customers. Okay. And that's the banner on their website. But what that means is they basically made make feed for animals, okay, cool. high performance animals, whether that means athletic animals such as racehorses or just really high volume um, animal okay. products like chicken, poultry and pigs. Okay, so um, that's like sort of what we do. Type thing. You, you're trying to be Sorry? like, so it's kind of like high performance food being like the best of the best, some kind of like branded feed stock. Yeah. Okay. It's all about basically the inputs that our customers purchase. They want to get the max out of that for those animals. Yeah. And it's our job to cater that diet to make sure we do get the most out of it and that yeah. we can provide a really competitive rate for that feed as well. So okay. that's what we do. Very cool. so and that range is like everything from like bunny feed for backyard bunnies all the way up to yeah. elite racehorses and salmon, prawns, everything in the Very middle. Cool. It's so, so what pretty it wide. Anything you know, wide range. Of, or is, it, is it kind of to, to the customer market at all or sorry, basic consumer market, or is it more of an industrial scale size operation? Sure. So we have a small portion of our business that's retail mm. and that sells like dog feed, cat feed, and your normal mm. sort of pet shop front, I suppose. Mm. Um, although that feed is catered more towards the agricultural consumer rather than mm. your normal sort of backyard chook consumer. Yeah, definitely. Um, but the majority of our production, our feed product is... Um, bulk stocks, so okay, so high level farm, thing, yeah, okay. yeah, for Very sure. Cool. So really high volumes. That's what we do. So that's what we do. Well. How how do you fit into that? Obviously, being a process engineer, a lot of people might not make that connection between feedstock and your you say your heat exchanges and your distillation columns type thing. How, how how do you kind of fit into the whole process? Sure. Well, if you probably reduce what a process engineer does to just input output in the box in the middle. Mm. and making sure that whatever's going in, they're getting the most of that out and the value in that out. And that box in the middle is how we do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking box. back to, you know, first year lectures here. Yeah. Good, <laughs> That's good on, basically what I do. Right we take a really highly variable input being grains, mm. meals, these sorts of ingredients, things that change season to season, year to year, and change in value all the time as well and turn into a very consistent product. And okay. our job is basically remove that variability out of that product for our customers. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, our customers would just go and buy that grain yeah. directly. So I, I'm guessing it's lots of kind of like refining stages, right? Uh, did you add in any kind of components of, at all to the feedstock, or is it mainly just kind of like a, a single chain process where you're just kind of refining it down and down until you get that final product? So it's mainly a batch process, and that's an inherited process based on the fact that our variables like do change rapidly and that's due to our inputs. Mm. Um, we are starting to get some continuous stages, which is pretty exciting, but that's more about us like reducing um, those variables okay. and having control early in the process. And oh. we do that through three major stages. Um, yeah. One is grinding, so size reduction. So we mm. take everything from a barley grain, which is this big, all the way down to a grain of salt mm. and basically try and get a consistent particle size across all of it. Mm. And that enables us to mix in liquid ingredients consistently. So we're reducing the variability at every step, basically, until we get to a palletization stage. And that's where we actually put that diet, that whole completed diet with all the ingredients you need, mm. kind of like making a cake, <laughs> and we turn it into a pallet. And what that yeah. provides to our customer is that they know that every single mouthful that animal takes, they're getting a complete diet mm. and in that one that consistency of product that is always going to be the same. Uh, that's basically just like like food a human would eat. Basically, you can always rely on it type thing. Okay, very cool. That's right. So if you if you think about your like um, solid dog food or anything like that, mm. 
it's a very similar process to that. In fact, I would say it's yeah, okay. extremely similar. And, yeah. and so, like in terms of Ridley as a company, you say that they're kind of a larger agri company in Australia. Obviously, the, the agricultural industry is quite broad, and you've you've got a whole different uh, a lot of aspects to it. Would you say they're kind of a larger one, or are they more small and like locally foc focused? So, if I was to sort of sum it up, we are the largest company of our type in Australia, oh, largest nice. provider of animal large performance large. solutions. So that's our like, yeah, yeah that, two box. Nice. <laughs> but you, you would really struggle to walk into a supermarket and that hasn't got a product that hasn't touched us in some way. Cause we provide, you know, we look after chooks that lay eggs. We look after the dairy industry. We, you know, huge range yeah. so you'd be hard pressed to find it i suppose yeah it's always yeah, surprising that's... when you come over across one of those companies where they have their fingers in so many pies but it's always yeah we've never heard of them and before and, and then you start working for them and you start hearing about it and you start seeing it everywhere and it's all you can see it's, it's crazy that's what it's like yeah, yeah definitely so, <laughs> for sure so i mean obviously you, you kind of know all these kind of products that are going on but like what's maybe like one of the biggest ones or two that that most people would recognize Sure. So I think that's probably our retail products. So um, at our retail level, we have Baristock Chook. Mm. So we, I guess, through various acquisitions, we bought that retail market, I suppose, as a way of diversifying um, ourselves. Mm. You know, we know that even if bulk agriculture um, has a dip, uh, people always have pets. Yeah, It's a growing right. industry that's in Australia true. and it's Definitely something that a lot of food companies have tapped into. We're not the only one. If you look at any major food company in Australia, if they're a big player, they're likely to have a link to pet food. And there's a reason for that. Mm. It's because pet food's okay. pretty high growth and it's very like high margin. Oh, well, like it's decreasing now, but it's that. a great value business. Yeah. So um, the products people would recognize would be our Barristock Backyard Chicken. Mm and our probably our cobber a cobber dog so our working dog oh, um if you're someone that has a dog that does a few more k's than your yeah. average i suppose city city pet then like i'm talking about like um like a, like a farm dog like like a blue like, like your sheep, sheep dogs, dogs yeah, yeah. kelpies and border collies yeah. that sort of thing um we're pretty mm. we're pretty much the go-to feed in that segment okay. so we kind of yeah, yeah very cool. <laughs> So, so yeah, what, that's what people know as well. Is like more focused on like short and long term. Are they looking to expand at all, or are they just kind of looking to kind of keep that local market or that Australian market, and then try and diversify their products a bit more? Sure. So, um, basically, for the last, oh, I suppose, so the late 1900s, so like the 80s and the 90s, they were really focused on acquisitions. So growing the business and forming it. They listed on the ASX in that time period. And they went on to acquire a lot of other big name brands basically to become the beast. Yeah. And then they consolidated that position by building new mills, closing assets that were old and degrading mm -hmm. um, and through innovating, developing new innovative products. And mm -hmm. I would say short term, they're really looking I've been involved in our latest build and that's mm. probably the last build for a while okay. and they're really looking now to get the most value they can out of the assets that they have okay. so we're looking at bringing in new customers new tons and also making sure our quality is really good out of those mills mm. and then the focus from there i suppose long term is looking at other innovative ways to improve yield for our customers and what do i mean by that i mean that our customers want to see for every like gram or it's probably not good to talk in grams every ton of product they buy from us they want to see the majority of that ton in gains for their animal uh, whether that performance like for a racehorse how fast it goes yeah okay for a chook it's weight you know yeah. so for an egg it's quality I so they so want to see that translation of value how, how do you even measure that kind of metric because you'd have to totally trust the customer it's, it's actually okay it sounds like i know it sounds a bit crazy but it's exactly yeah. the same way as we calculate yield in engineering you just basically go okay i'm feeding yeah. my animal five kilos or whatever yeah. a day okay now i'm weighing my little pig every day <laughs> how much of that five kilos is going on its body weight and then yeah, you okay. put that number over that number, times it by 100, and then you, you have you. Yeah. I suppose it's pretty easy, but I mean, it just still seems like a, a kind of abstract concept until you kind of see it in action, I suppose. I know, yeah. I know, but they almost treat each animal like its own like processing machine yeah. production, and 
Yeah, I know. When I first heard of this, I was like, what? <laughs> What's this concept? Okay. Yeah, but that's, look, that's what we, one of our um, huge innovations recently is Novak and that's mm. in the prawn industry. Um, okay. And we're looking to add these new products all the time mm. um, so that basically our customers buy more of our feed yeah. and there's more value for them as well. So is that prawn yeah. industry like inside fish farms or is that in like um, just, just fresh water or off the coast? Oh, surely it'd be in fish farms, wouldn't it? If you're feeding them feedstock. Yeah, so they're pretty large scale um, because of prawns are pretty finicky when it comes to water temperature. Yeah. I don't know much about the aqua feeding industry, to be honest with you, but I do know that. And that's why our prawn um, farms and our sort of innovation around that is based in Thailand. So mm. we're at a pilot stage for that project and that's happening over there at the moment. Okay. So, Very cool. yeah. so the yeah. compared to the rest of Asia, the Australian prawn industry is quite small. Really? Okay. Okay, so where exactly do, do you fit into this whole kind of process at Ridley? What, what are your kind of day-to-day -day responsibilities and roles? Sure. So before I joined the company, we didn't actually have a process engineering arm. We have a very, very lean engineering team. We outsource a lot of our direct engineering to contractors. Okay. What we do in-house is um, what we need all the time. Mm. So we're talking, we have a mechanical engineer, we have an electrical engineer, mm. and just general site work type thing on house. Yeah, yeah. So general upgrade stuff that happens all the time. So mm. I was sort of brought in because I fell into the internship program and then sort of mm. started solving problems and really enjoyed solving these processing problems that we're having mm. because they're, they're a new company dealing with very old assets. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. So they're wanting solutions that don't, don't necessarily have a... Yeah. Big investment, if that makes sense. Like They're looking for old dog new tricks. Yeah, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. So they're looking, I guess, that that process improvement that's going to come through from continuous improvement projects. And they'd sort of, I guess, got to a point where they'd extended themselves in that area. Mm. You know, you can always do better. And um, I think they needed a bit of more of a deep dive, especially because they're taking on a lot of new technology quite quickly. Mm. Um, when I say new technology, I mean automation yeah um so the manufacturing industry like everyone would know has gone through a huge transformation in the past 20 years and Ridley's no different but we've sort of been able to get by without completely transforming yeah. um but I, I i think we're really at sort of the start of that that process yeah. and yeah they definitely saw a need to have someone like me on the team i think oh, very cool. yeah so it is your kind of data J job. Is it just kind of monitoring the process, making sure it's all run smoothly, or is it more like like driving that innovation towards automation away from that batch process type thing? Or, or, or can't you say is it a bit hush hush? No, no, one hundred percent. Unfortunately, I'm just well. I'm still in commission, but I've just come through a commission, which we did a fifty million dollar build, mm. um, and that was commissioned in. April, but mm. commissioning doesn't just happen. You just don't turn it yeah. on and walk away. There's okay. plenty to do after it. Yeah. But because of that, I guess I sort of just, they asked me to be on the team. So I dropped whatever my job was going to be and just yeah. went straight into that guns blazing. So what I did as part of that was I managed the maintenance system, the quality system, information management and safety systems. Yeah. And that may sound like a lot, but when you don't have any um, I mean, there's, there was only half a dozen really employees on site, exactly. hundred of con contractors, mm. you have to, and you still have to run all your other mills. So you have to have quite a lean approach. Definitely. And, um, and so like, learnt a lot through doing that oh yeah, I can and imagine. didn't do so much hands-on engineering. Like, mm. I mean, we were turning on a plant. So of course you're required to really think stuff through, yeah. you're looking to achieve Basically, you want to get it running. Yeah. Um, but, but there's a lot of background. And that background. was the majority of my role. Now yeah. my role is transitioning a lot more to that process improvement. Mm. Yeah, so now my role is basically, okay, this mill was spec'd at X throughput, X efficiency. Yeah. We're achieving this right now because we're still coming up to capacity. Mm. How do we get here? And that's what my role is really going to be for the next six months at least. Oh, I very think. cool. I think very, very cool. <laughs> could change. So, I mean, uh, yeah, the industry. And, and I, what that involves, um, different process stages, wherever we're falling short. 
Mm, definitely. Um, so, you, I mean, we've heard a lot in the news over the last couple of years, especially about uh, how... You kind of... I think I'm like, I coming out a little bit. I, I kind of got that dodgy message saying my internet's gone unstable again. It, has it come good or...? It's come good now, okay. yeah. You were dodgy for a little bit, but you're all good. Yeah, I, I, like, I don't know what's going on with it, but yeah. All right, well, we'll get back into it. Um, okay. <laughs> This is why I love the editing tools. So I, I, I don't care if, if anything messes up. And I honestly expected my internet to like bum out at one point, but I've been pretty <laughs> lucky with the first few interviews I've done. Like nothing went wrong. I was like, oh, thank God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just got to find where it was. Oh yeah, so I mean, engineering students wouldn't really typically know too much about the agriculture industry unless you kind of grew up in and around it. But we've seen a, a fair bit in the news lately. Um, how, how would you say it's kind of been developing over the last 10, 15, 20 years? Have you seen it just kind of steady kind of increase in demand, but, but no real change in, in practices or how things are done? Or you think with like um, current advancements in technology and stuff, it's really driving that, that push. I mean, you've said already a little bit that Ridley's kind of making that swap to a manual batch style process to an automation driven one. Do you think that's a kind of sweeping change that's being seen across the whole industry or is it just kind of chopping and changing here and there type of thing? Um, so I'm just going to give you a fun fact because I found a fun fact. Um, oh, so since the 1960s, we've increased our production two and a half times. Right, okay. From what we produce. And we, are, we did that with 11% more land. That's crazy. So, so that, that's efficiency and, and process optimization right there, 100%. Yeah, that's huge. Like a, like so, a example. Yeah, I found that fact. I was like, yeah, that's going to really back up what I'm going to say. <laughs> um, and how we've done that is through a suite of solutions. Like I'm talking everything from genetics, so driving genetics forward, um, selection, cropping selection, species selection, all that sort of stuff. Um, pesticides, fungicides. We're talking sensors, uh, GPS technology. And I'll give you some examples, but... Basically what farming is, is a highly, highly variable oh, yeah. production Very industry, awesome. right? Yeah. And what we've striven to do in like the last, like since time began is be able to control yeah. as much as you can. So at the start, when you think of like tillage, when you think of sowing plants, you, you think of gardens where they, you know, even when you think, Imagine like a cropping regimen where you've got all your plants in one row. Mm. Believe it or not, that was like a huge farming innovation to do that. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. because you can controlling that each plant has the same soil area. Mm. It's getting the same amount of sunlight suddenly. Okay. okay. You know, you control how much yeah. you're watering. So all those measures of control drives innovation, drives performance. Mm. And we've done that really well in Australia, like really well because we've had amazing export opportunities into Asia, the growing middle class in the last 20 years has really driven our production forward. For example, we, mm. we export 70% of what we produce here in agriculture. Mm, definitely. Whereas if you can, you know, that's, that is a huge amount. Like that's a huge net surplus. So I remember when all the things with COVID came out being like, oh, food scarcity. And I was like, no, ah. We, we're good. We're good here, guys. We're pretty flush. Like, <laughs> yeah, we make a lot of food. <laughs> Um, so, so what would you but yeah, say some, there's some pretty exciting new like things coming out. Um, m more recently, um, would be bacteria mm. like control. So looking at okay, how, what's the makeup of our soil bacteria? Mm. There's millions of species here. What are they doing? You know, yeah. starting to understand how that works, how they are involved. Um, yeah, there's plenty of examples as. We've done pretty good. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I think if anyone doesn't understand the Australian agri industry, just know to be proud of it. Like we're, we're good. <laughs> it's, it's good to know. It's very reassuring and comforting for a lot of people right now, I'm sure. So what, yeah. what would you say then, apart from trying to get that kind of consistency in that, that inherently variable kind of industry, what would you say yeah. is like the, the kind of largest challenge you guys are facing uh, moving forward now? Look, I think, I mean... <laughs> I think the number one is climate change. Mm. Because if you think about the fact that we've put all this innovation into controlling things mm. 
and suddenly there's this big thing <laughs> that we can't control and it's the one thing we've had a lot of tricky times controlling which is the weather yeah there's still not a farmer out there who can control the weather mm. i mean people try with irrigation systems and that sort of mm. thing but yeah climate change is a real worry but australia is hectically producing reports and predictions and trying to forecast mm. um because for an example, um, a wine grower in South Australia's Barossa region mm. planted vineyards seven years ago with the projection that those vineyards will fruit for X amount of decades. Yeah. But by, you know, a certain year period, we're going to have a three degree increase in weather temperature. What, what does that mean? Does that mean he's not in, you know, does that mean he's, He's not in France anymore. Now he's in Spain. Should he change to sp Spanish yeah, vineyards? How's it going to affect his product over time type thing and trying to, trying to adjust your expectations accordingly? Exactly. Like we're talking about like a huge, even though I talk about irrigation and where a lot of the people listening would be pretty um, familiar with Victoria. Mm. I mean, a lot of them go to RMIT, right? And in Victoria, we irrigate really well and we have pretty good rainfall and we have access to river systems and dams, but there's huge amounts of arable land in New South Wales and Queensland, which are highly susceptible to changes in weather, especially drought and especially lack of rainfall. And I think, you know, you, even if you've only watched the news once in the yeah. last oh, two the, years, the, you would know that there was a drought on. Yeah. So I think climate change is a huge concern and huge worry and, um, I mean, there's plenty of climate deniers out of there in the farming community, unfortunately, but I think people would be surprised how much traction there is in that area. You know, not every farmer is burying their head in the sand, that's for sure. Okay. And, and then I suppose the other question I've got to ask is, uh, obviously, there's a massive global pandemic going on at the moment. Uh, yeah, how, how yeah, yeah. Guys, have you guys been affected by that at all? Uh, I mean, I know that in an agribusiness, it's, it's super important that you have, like, biosecurity kind of, restrictions in place i mean yeah, you see all the signs when you drive into state and you see them when you're ever you're trying to import or export food have you guys been affected by that or is it is it just kind of like a supply chain problem where you can't get your product to the customers into state so probably initially we i was just at, actually i was pretty amazed and pretty stoked with how really reacted to the covid problem because yeah we we're good at this we deal with biosecurity issues all the time and we have literally risk strategy around biosecurity because if a flu came through and killed all of our peak population which all asf african swine fever look it up yes. um, <laughs> um it's in asia right now so we were like literally prepared for a pandemic we're always prepared for a pandemic because mm. we're so close to asia i think um so that was pretty reassuring i think to see that because like you said we're pretty into biosecurity yeah. um you know, we, we provide lots of guarantees to our customers yeah. that we have really high stringent biosecurity standards. Yeah. So that was pretty cool to see, but So you're yeah. already just super We're, prepared for it. It wasn't a massive change to just kind of implement those few extra little protocols to, to make sure you, you still were in, in line with all the kind of regulations and such. Funnily enough, the biggest one was trucks. Yeah, tr trucks has been a big problem for a lot of people right now. Yeah, so we have, um, we're pretty localised, so the where our big production centres are and where we manufacture feed is pretty close to where we're supplying that feed and that's mm. purely on a cost per travel basis. Like the further away that farm is, the more expensive that feed's going to get. Yeah. To get yeah, yeah. But we did yeah, have a lot of issues with sort of grain coming in to New South Wales from Victoria, so inputs, yeah. uh, a lot of issues with sending feed outside yeah. of the state interstate um yeah. not to mention the fact that our specialties so our nutrition quality safety departments are not site-based people so they all travel for work so really being an agricultural company i wouldn't say we're like google <laughs> we have a long way to go <laughs> in terms of it and covid certainly progressed that i think yeah. there's been a lot of positives out of it like that people would have never been out of Zoom meeting, yeah, but yeah. it's amazing how quickly people have progressed in that area. Yeah. yeah. It would have very much been a, nah, guys, I need you all in the office this day, this time. We've got to have a meeting, go be in person, da 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 da. But it, it's, it's kind of. I relate to all of the memes. 
Oh, basically. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. wait, wait, you, you know how terrible my internet is. I, I'm feeling the pain and I cannot wait to get back into the office as soon as possible. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Um, so I guess next question I've got to ask you is, is how, how exactly did you find your first role at Ridley? You, you're mentioning something about an internship program that kind of progressed. Were you just kind of like uh, the, the, the annoying person that stuck around that they couldn't really get rid of? Or they were like, hey, got something here. Definitely got something here. Yeah, um, so I was initially the annoying person that applied for the internship that I wasn't qualified to do. So Ridley advertised an internship uh, for a vet student, I think. Um, and this goes into like my advice to people. I was really keen to get into the food and ag industry mm. and internships in engineering for those industries don't come up very often and they're few and far between. So when I saw an internship for a vet student, but I read the descriptor of what the role would entail, I'm like, oh, I could, I could do that. It was data analysis basically. Oh, and it was like, just has to have, the two requirements was can use Excel and has to have an interest in agriculture. I'm like, oh. I have both of those things. So I just applied for it and they're like, you're not a vet student. I'm like, correct. <laughs> but I can use Excel and I do want to work on a farm. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be honest, I did my research. I yeah. looked them up. I figured out they did production. I thought if I take, took on this internship, maybe I'd be able to segue. And mm. and I was it's very lucky to have a pretty yeah, yeah. amazing boss who was like, that was actually an unpaid internship. And she was like, mm. hey, you're working here for free. If you want to do a day with the engineering team or a day with quality or any of these departments, just let me know and we can do it. And I ended up publishing a pa paper with her, um, co-authoring co a paper with her that year um, on the work we did, which was an amazing experience. And then um, took a while for them to come up with a role for me. It took about a year for them to go, okay, yep, we like what you got. Come, come back. And they offered um a partnership to do my capstone project in my final oh, yeah. year so that's yeah. how it all kind of flowed in so yeah. seeing as i've kind of created that whole role for you then would you say there's kind of a, a further career track trajectory you want to take with ridley or are you kind of looking to stay there current role for a while and maybe swap around a bit like what, what are your kind of career aspirations moving forward so the way i sort of figured it out and set it up was basically because they created this role like for me didn't exist before it's kind of like oh cool could we turn it into a bit of a grad program of sorts you know i'm choosing this company because i love the culture and love what they're for i suppose like really believed in the vision believed in the values and i was like okay this is for me but i wanted to make sure i didn't miss out in any of that grad program idea that you mm. try out lots of different things yeah definitely and i guess i just made that really clear i was like look yep happy to come in and work for you happy to take this role on board but can i have yeah. some variety can i try lots of different things because i don't know if i want to be an engineer yet. i don't know if that 100 <laughs> no yeah. true i just don't well, know if that's 100 yeah, what that's, i want to do that's definitely been me a few times before you, you go for a role you think oh my god this is this is what i want this is what engineering is all about and then you get into it and you're like maybe i don't want to be stuck behind a computer all day maybe i, I kind of want to get in the field and you realize there's so many more different aspects that kind of open up to you and it's, it's really really important to try and shop around a little bit and just kind of see where your skills fit in best a hundred a hundred percent and quite honestly doing that has definitely made me a better engineer because whenever I'm caught according like here's a problem I'll solve it you understand the context of that problem a lot better like for example at this in this commission I was an operator for a month so I literally was on night shift being an operator um, I managed the truck logistics for a couple of weeks uh, managed the safety for a couple of weeks mm. and basically we didn't it sounds silly but I didn't even plan for that to happen it was just a need thing like mm. we need someone to do this and i was like okay you know yeah. i'll have a crack at it and see how we go yeah. um especially because of covid yeah covid was weirdly a blessing in disguise for me because it meant that we couldn't call in these specialists in these fields mm. so instead i had to sort of be their representative at the site yeah and that was key as well like i knew i wanted to be on a site i knew that sitting in office like you said yeah. five days a week nine to five not did not work for me yeah and say, i push for that yeah yeah pretty so, hard so what kind of advice would you give to students who are trying to get into the agriculture industry would you say try and go the same route you've gone is there maybe some kind of um 
high, 2020 hindsight you, you could give to people? Um, from a, If you're trying to get into it as a chemical engineer, mm. they don't know that we're good for them. <laughs> Traditionally, they hire a lot of, they hire mechanical engineers, they hire electrical engineers, they hire the one for the job that they don't have, basically. Mm. So you really have to sell what you're doing to them. I think it might be a historical thing, I'm not sure, but they see chemical engineering go, oh, we don't we don't need one of those. We don't have, yeah. we don't manufacture chemicals. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think you have to be really good at articulating what your skills are and how they're transferable to the industry. Mm. I think you need a bit of a passion for it. I mean, people definitely, I mean, I don't want to sound cheap here, but people are definitely passionate about ag. That's why they're there. They love the industry. It's an awesome culture, mm. very family oriented, um, a bit old school in places, but I would say, yeah, all in all, really great industry to work for. And if it sounds like something you'd like, then message me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to give you some advice, like for sure. And I think what's cool about ag is they haven't got it figured out yet. Mm. They can see here, but they are not yeah. there yet. And so I think there's an amazing opportunity to be a part of growing something yeah. and, and taking Australian ag into like the automation age, which is pretty exciting. Yeah. Like a lot of industries have kind of got that covered. So, so, so you can't I think it's like the one pocket where you could do something amazing there. And <laughs> they just, yeah, yeah, they really value so it. Kind of so I think that there might be a kind of a more of a job market there for a process engineer to try and push that the kind of innovation really move it forward yeah i read it like something the other day like the um there's one of the most advertised jobs in ag now that's not filled is software engineers yeah of all things that just doesn't sound like it, it belongs on a farm I, I know but if you uh, think about we're suddenly suddenly we've got access to cheap sensors mm. and so we've got all this data and you don't know what to but do. What do we do with it? <laughs> and so yeah. just like a crazy, if you look at any sort of Silicon Valley startup group or anything like that in Melbourne even, there's so many software startups and app startups for ag because they've just got enormous amounts of data Yeah. and they need to analyse it quickly. So how do they do that? I think there's lots of avenues in ag. But I think the key one is make sure that you can articulate your transferable skills mm know what they are i'll give you a clue it's problem solving analytical all, those, all, all the things they tell you to put on your resume stuff like that yeah That's exactly that. um and another thing about ag just just to, sounds like um kind of silly and basic but mm. you do need to have the confidence if fake or real doesn't matter but have the confidence to talk to people that seem outside your league mm. Because I think those boundaries between the CEO and you are a lot less a lot than you really prominent in ag. And the other thing is don't also have the humility to talk to people that feel below you, you know, yeah. um, because they're the people that you're going to learn the goal from 100%. Uh, well, Molly, it's been absolutely amazing talking to you again. Uh, I'm sure we could go round and round talking about all the innovations and the potential job markets for, for ag and, and the, the industry itself. But um, th thanks for coming on and joining us for, for this episode of Industry Insights. Um, guys that are listening at home, uh, if you've liked this episode, please give it a like, share it around to your friends, comment down below if you've got any uh, questions you want to ask in up upcoming episodes or if you've got any other companies or any other people that you want to hear from. Um, we're, we're here for you guys. We're, we're here to try and make sure that you guys are across the, the best way to break into the industry and what's going on in the industry right now. Um, but for now, yeah, might wrap it up. Cheers again, Molly, and uh, we'll see everyone next week.